Hello, I'm Carl Schlimm, Director of Flight Operations for Aviation Performance Solutions. I'd like to discuss channeling adrenaline or the effective use of stress in the upset prevention and recovery training environment. This is an overview of the topics that I'll discuss. We'll look at the physiology of stress. We'll discuss adrenalized learning and what it means. We'll take a look at the anatomy of a successful stress-enhanced training environment. We'll discuss startle factor. And we'll look at how the proper introduction and use of stress in the training environment can prepare a pilot for real-world crises. The objectives of this presentation are to emphasize to the audience that the following concepts are important for a successful UPRT training environment. Realistic task relevant stressors are beneficial. Stress must be managed in the training environment. Startle must be introduced after skills and competence are achieved, should not be overused, and should not be introduced early. A negative or traumatic training experience, even just one, can have long lasting detrimental effects on a pilot and need to be avoided. Presentation overview. We'll look at what is adrenalized learning, types of stress, physiological and individual response to stress, the advantages of adrenalized learning, and the elements of the adrenalized learning environment. So what is adrenalized learning? The actual term adrenalized learning was coined by Rich Stoll, who's a master CFI, aerobatic, and longtime provider of upset prevention and recovery training. My personal definition uh, is the following. It's enhanced learning in a training environment, preferably much of it on aircraft, to provide realism and a sense of urgency. Training which exposes pilots to realistic task-relevant stressors while they develop proper skills and awareness to recover from a training event. Doing so then will better enable a pilot to react in a timely and efficient manner in the presence of similar stressors during a similar real-world event. So what are types of stress? First of all, there's chronic stress or long-term sustained stress with cumulative detrimental effects. Examples may be flying anxiety, time pressures, personal issues that are chronic or long-lasting. Could be family or financial or anything for that matter. In chronic stress, the degree of stress typically is lower but sustained for longer periods of time and it can have detrimental long-term effects on your ability to cope with crises. It can impact your working memory uh, and your ability to recall. Acute stress, on the other hand, is short-term event-specific stress. An example would be stress resulting from a sudden low-altitude wake turbulence encounter. The degree of stress can be low to moderate, but also can be severe or incapacitating, and is very short uh, uh, in duration. The negative effects of all stress, chronic and an acute, are cumulative. Let's now discuss the psychophysiological or psychological and physiological effects of stress. We'll look at physiological effects first. When stress, uh, when a pilot's exposed to a stressful environment, there's a release of hormones, for instance, cortisol and adrenaline. There's an elevated sensory performance and motor skill accuracy up to a certain point beyond which it can become incapacitating. The fight or flight response is what we're talking about here. Whether you're being chased by a tiger or let's say you encounter a wake turbulence encounter in flight, the whole idea with this elevated level of stress is to remove you from that environment as quickly as possible. Okay, You want to get away from the tiger, you want to get away from that un out of control situation, that wake turbulence encounter and recover. The physiological effect is to enhance performance to adapt quickly to survive and eliminate the stressful stimuli. Now the psychological effects uh, or responses to stress are the following. A feeling of enhanced performance and urgency to react. All right, if it's excessive though, it can cause anxiety and panic. Let's look at the stress curve. We'll look at stress versus performance. 
Probably right now as you listen to this presentation, you're in your comfort zone. When you're out flying your airplane, you're confident, uh, you're not encountering an emergency, uh, you are in your comfort zone as well. You're on the uh, near side of that curve and uh, stress is fairly low. This is the inverted U curve. Stress can enhance performance up to a certain point as you can see on this curve. As we encounter a crisis, we might be we might go toward the peak of the curve or actually a little bit back to the other side and uh, but not to the point where exhaustion occurs uh, or it's incapacitating. Acute stress, again short duration, event specific like a wake turbulence encounter. Now there's intrinsic stress which is related to the event or task. In other words, uh, you encounter wake turbulence and you get terrain proximity warning. Extrinsic means that it is present regardless of the event or task. It's gonna, it was going to be there anyway. Heat, vibration, fatigue. It's all still cumulative. All acute, intrinsic, and extrinsic, extrinsic stress again, and chronic stress is cumulative. Let's look at the individual stress response. Individual response to a stressor, not the stressor itself, determines an individual's level of stress. And this varies widely from pilot to pilot. Pilots who feel in control of a situation typically will have reduced stress and will avoid panic. Now that sense of control does not guarantee a successful outcome, for instance if they haven't been trained properly. Pilots may not accurately assess their abilities and situational awareness. And general flying experience may not significantly reduce stress in the loss of control and flight regime either. If you've never been upside down, flying upright for 15,000, 20,000 hours will not prepare you for an overbank situation, especially if it's extreme. You need specific training in that environment. Hence, previous training in the loss of control and flight events and recovery can improve outcome while reducing stress. Let's look at the specific reaction to stress. A few things occur. First of all, you're going to have an overall reduction in your situational awareness. You might get channelized attention or fixation or tunnel vision. Hence, narrowing of visual field and fixation. Inhibited working memory, inhibited recall, and also information processing. Poor judgment. Reduced accuracy of inputs inhibited motor function or overreaction. Increase in reaction time as well. Cognitive bias and non-task activity. Cognitive bias uh, is a, an extensive topic on its own, uh, but it typically results from an incomplete mental model. You don't have the big picture. You don't have a complete picture. Uh, you may be upside down and overbanked, but because you're not looking around for the horizon or interpreting cues correctly, you may actually think you're upright in a steep dive and then you start pulling, which could be detrimental because you're overbanked. Non-task activity relates to the fact that pilots typically want to do something in a crisis and it could be the wrong thing. Again, especially if you're not trained properly. So adrenalized learning in a properly structured training environment can help. Looking at upset prevention and recovery training is what we'll do next specifically. Successful recovery hinges on high situational awareness. Objective oriented to recognize a loss of control in flight event, vulnerability in each phase of flight. Takeoff uh, and route high altitude en route descent, approach and landing, and then prevent or recover from a loss of control in flight event. Some of your situational awareness has to be devoted to what would what I do if I encountered an LOCI event. It, uh, and that is in addition to the situational awareness that you normally uh, devote time to. That's what we mean by objective oriented. Some SA has to be objective oriented to prevention awareness and prevention of an upset or recovery, should it happen. Proper interpretation of sensory cues, all sensory cues, visual, oral, somatosensory. Uh, in, interpretation of G cues and, and how to respond to them. Uh, inter, uh, correct interpretation of visual cues, for instance. Correct and timely response to cueing, which entails proper skill development. Proper stress management 
and maintenance at performance enhancing level. Again, the UPRT uh, environment can help significantly with this. Correct and efficient cognitive functioning along with proper skills and high SA during stressful events is important in aviation. More on a generalized learning in the upset prevention and recovery training environment. Let's look at all attitude envelope exposure. If you look at the graph on the right, uh, you go from the blue to the yellow to the red. Uh, yellow is typically what's addressed uh, or, or even ex a pilot's exposed to, just briefly, in normal licensing training. Briefly to plus or minus 30 degrees of pitch, 60 degrees of bank. Not, not uh, uh, exposed for very long, obviously. And the blue is uh, the definition of an upset. That's the upset envelope. The red is typically where pilots don't go, and that's where you do need to go in upset prevention and recovery training. All attitudes, nose up, nose down, 360 degrees of roll. Adrenalized learning in UPRT is about recall technology in a crisis as well, in a stressful environment. Dramatic events must be incorporated, startle and surprise. Only at the right time, we'll talk about that. Realistic task relevant stressors. Building block approach. Confidence is important. Realism and a sense of urgency. On aircraft training is very important for this. And adrenalized learning in UPRT must address the psychophysiology of fear. Let's look at the loss of control in flight risk time analysis. Competency growth is dynamic beyond licensing training, okay? In other words, into uh, advanced training and the UPRT environment, which is very important. When you look at a beginning pilot, uh, his uh, uh, gap between perception and detection of an event occurring or crisis and the point at which he is incapacitated is very narrow. Beyond incapacitation, obviously, an accident is, is destined to occur. Through training, through uh, advanced training, UPRT training, for instance, awareness increases, the spread between perception, detection, and incapacitation increases as well. Prevention, recovery and enhanced prevention, that's what UPRT is about. Earlier perception and detection and a better ability to handle an event uh, before incapacitation is even a factor. Let's discuss structuring an effective adrenalized learning environment. We'll talk about safety margins, a positive learning environment, the building block approach, diverse context relevant stressors, facilitated visualization, and confidence and skills before startle. Also, IP management of stressors and stress. First, safety margins. Student must have confidence in instructor abilities. The instructor must not only be the expert, but must be perceived as the expert. There must be a margin of safety in terms of aircraft capabilities, and maneuver and altitude margins. You need a robust aerobatic trainer to do this. And you need to be at a safe altitude, uh, given the fact that the, the student might do something unexpected. Must have room to recover from the dive. And you must stay within the envelope of the aircraft. Realism and relevant stressors never trump safety, however. In other words, if you're doing a wake turbulence encounter, simulated wake turbulence encounter, you want to be maybe a little bit lower uh, than if you're simulating a high altitude overbank upset. But you want to give room for the worst case scenario. Let's talk about a positive learning environment. You can tailor it to the student need to have a little bit of an idea of their experience in training, what types of aircraft they fly, have they done any aerobatic training, have they done any UPRT training. 
What are their physiological known or potential limitations? Are they afraid of roller coasters? Do they get sick in the car? Uh, do they get air sick in the airplane? Uh, you may not know before uh, training occurs because UPRT training is typically very foreign to most pilots. So they may not know they're going to get air sick, something that uh, you may determine on the first or second ride. What are their known apprehensions? Typically, they are going to be apprehensive. That's a given. But if they have known apprehensions, discuss it with them. Alleviate those uh, apprehensions as best you can. Have they had any previous traumatic real world or training experiences? That's very important. Uh, traumatic spin experience in the training environment. Uh, you want to know that. This is a great opportunity, the UPRT environment, to uh, take them away from that. Otherwise, they may never gain that confidence uh, that they need back in the flying realm. Building block approach. There has to be an exposure to progressive increases in pitch bank and airspeed extremes. Progressive. As they gain confidence and skills. An example would be an overbank nose low upset. Now, first of all, in a typical UPRT training environment, you might do an aileron roll early on in the training program, but that's typically something that is very canned, low threat, easy to do. You're not practicing skills, uh, recovery skills, or, or, or anything like that. So it's a great low threat way to be exposed to 360 degrees of roll. Now, when you practice skill, uh, recovery skills, uh, typically you can start with a slipping stall and the student might be exposed to a low airspeed, for instance, an 80 to 90 degree bank upset uh, following the stall. Later on, you can do a skidding stall, obviously as an example uh, here of what you don't want to do uh, in the real world. Uh, this is a low airspeed varying bank, could be up to 120, 130 degrees of bank. Okay, so you can see the bank angle is increasing, confidence increasing, skills increasing, proper interpretation of visual cues. And then simulating a high altitude environment to gradually increasing bank to 180 degrees. Varying airspeed, medium to high, wind rush, although they may not get that in their airplane unless they're going really fast. That's something you can incorporate. It is a realistic stressor, something they have to overcome in an aerobatic a trainer aircraft. And then once they've recovered from those high altitude cruise situations, they'll go on to simulated wake turbulence, low, slow, and draggy simulation. So uh, you can see the, the diversity of the overbank situation. Low high speed, low high altitude, different scenarios. Wake turbulence, for instance, is a great way to introduce uh, startle. Okay, abrupt entry. Shouldn't be overly abrupt or aggressive. You don't want to bang their head off the canopy, but uh, it should introduce startle at a time when their confidence level and skill set uh, give them the capability to handle it successfully, not too early. Diverse context relevant stress. Okay, realistic stressors should be incorporated and they should be relevant to the task or event. Wide variety of stressors are important. And simulating as close to real world stressors relevant to the task as possible. For instance, wake turbulence and recovery, we'll discuss that a little bit more. The goal is that a pilot will be better able to work through stress in the real world. It takes a very experienced instructor to incorporate realistic, relevant stressors in the training environment. The example, simulated wake turbulence encounter. First of all, the instructor can facilitate uh, this uh, scenario, this training environment by telling the student not to visualize himself in his current aircraft, uh, the training aircraft, uh, uh, but to visualize himself in his airplane, whether it's a King Air or a Gulfstream uh, or any type of aircraft for that matter. Large aircraft, larger aircraft, low, configured, and slow. Okay, put him in the environment. That's very important. Setup is important as well. Okay, low medium altitude versus high altitude. Again, it can't be so low that you don't give yourself an out if the student does a worst case uh, error, okay, like pull through, overbanked. You need to have plenty of altitude to recover above a minimum uh, safe altitude or legal altitude. But doing a wake, simulated wake turbulence encounter in an all altitude trainer at 6,000 feet is probably more realistic. Uh, than doing one at nine or 10,000 feet. The horizon is a little bit higher on the uh, canopy. Ground contrast is a little bit greater and, uh, and 
etc. And slow. You want to be slow, at least initially, uh, for the setup. Uh, the control feel is different. It's more sluggish. That's a that can be a stressor in itself. You're closer to the stall. Okay, getting into a stall uh, can be a stressor. It has to be overcome while executing proper recovery procedures. And again, the entry should be abrupt. Startle uh, is a, it's a good time to introduce startle here. Visualization. The instructor can facilitate visualization. Okay, again, visualization of a real world type situation. We're not in an all attitude trainer. Uh, we're in a real world situation. Transport category aircraft, for instance, lower to the ground. This enhances your sense of urgency and transfer of skill to their aircraft. It enhances realism and the context of training environment stressors. Example is a split S maneuver. This is obviously a demonstration of what not to do in an overbank scenario. Again, the instructor can tell the student, visualize yourself in your golf stream, not in the extra 300, for instance, that's a typical all attitude trainer. In your aircraft, if you did a split S type maneuver or pull through from an overbank scenario, you'd have extreme altitude loss. You'd go way beyond your airspeed limits, possibly over G the airplane as well. Confidence and skills are very important before startle is introduced. Build core skills first, including awareness and timely decision making. Confidence must be gained then introduce surprise and startle factor. At such point, the fight or flight response is initiated. Pilot must have skills to recover, know that he can recover, or the training event may be traumatizing, and that has to be avoided. It's counterproductive and increases stress levels uh, inappropriately. So to summarize, Constructing an effective UPRT training environment, focusing on building skills and awareness while incorporating a diverse set of realistic context, relevant stressors is important. The proper management of adrenalized learning in the training environment to produce a productive and positive learning environment enhances the value of training. Thank you for your time. Again, this is Carl Schlin, Director of Flight Operations for Aviation Performance Solutions which specializes on the delivery of upset prevention and recovery training for pilots of all skill levels to dramatically reduce the loss of control and flight threat. We offer online, on-aircraft, advanced simulator, train-the-trainer, and integrated upset training solutions. Please visit us at APSTraining.com, and thank you for your time today.